I will give you unlimited amount of revisions. And that's part of my... <laughs> Okay, so speaking of money, um, a lot of creatives struggle with how to price their services, mm -hmm. right? You've got your hourly yeah. rate, your day rate, your you know project your project rate, your retainers, etc. Um, you've got some interesting uh, interesting perspective on that that I think a lot of people would be would like to know. So sure, talk to me about that. Yeah, so like you mentioned, there's all these different ways you can make money as a motion designer, as a post production mm -hmm. guy, or an editor. Yeah. Um, you got your day rates, which is just charged per day, like X amount of dollars per day, right? Mm -hmm. And that's your value. You get your hourly rates, which is basically your day rate broken down, down into hours. You have a project rate, which is just here's a lump sum for the project. And then you have like retainer fees and value-based work where, mm -hmm. you know, if you wanted, if he was alive, Pablo Picasso to paint you a square, his square is going to be a lot more <laughs> expensive than my square because he's Pablo freaking Picasso. And that's like a value-based pricing system, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, for me... I don't do hourly rate and I don't do day rate. I Where did that decision come rate. from? I want to know. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it came from just looking at numbers because if you look at it, there's only a certain number of days in a year. And if I cap it, like, you know, most people probably won't pay more than a thousand dollars for a motion designer at my level. Right. At least right now. So if I ca if I ran the days out and that's per day, not per hour. But if I ran the days out, you know, working about 250 days a year constantly, which is never the case, you've never got constantly a, you've got booked, a cap on what you can make. You can make $250,000 a year, right? And, and this which is, is nothing to sneeze rate. at, but no, it's not, you know, that's it's nothing it's to not, sneeze at. That's a very, that's six figures, man. Like right. that's a lot of money, but there's only a certain amount of time in a year and hours right. in a day yep. with project rate. And, and also with the hourly rates and day rates, what happens with a lot of companies is say, hey, can we book you for next week, Monday through Friday? Okay, yeah, I'm $1,000 a day. Monday through Friday, that's five days, five grand, boom. Well, let's say I do the work, I finish the work early, I get it done on Thursday, right? They're sure. happy with it, but they still booked my Friday and I'm just waiting on revisions or an email back from them to say we're all good. I ethically can't work on anything on Friday because they're already paying me for that day, mm -hmm. right? So if another client came and said, Will, can you do this for us on Friday, even though I'm not doing anything else, like ethically, I don't feel right. good about double booking sure. people because it's not right. Or if right. they did have revisions, then you could have yourself in a little pickle there, exactly. right? So, yeah. Exactly. And so that's why I do project rates. Because with project rates, I can work on simultaneously multiple things at a time. And I, yeah. I, I know a lot in this industry, it's like, hey, we work on something, we send it off, we're waiting for feedback, but that could be a day, two days, three days for yeah. feedback. And we're just waiting. Right. Yep. So in that waiting time, I can be working on something else. Send that back, that back or mm -hmm. send that out for feedback. And then I get feedback on the other thing. And then you're mm -hmm. pivoting constantly. So I typically always have about 12 to 18 projects at a time that I'm simultaneously working on mm -hmm. kind of all the time. Um, and each, you know, different project rates from very, very low for like friends and stuff and sure. all of that to like just high end stuff that I'm part of a bigger team on that I'm kind of right. orchestrating. So that's kind of like my spiel on project rates. And there's no, you can, however much you want to make in a year is determined by the value of the work and how many projects you get in. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned revisions. You've got mm -hmm. a, a philosophy about that. What do you charge for revisions or how do you handle revisions? Exactly. So when project rates come in, the biggest thing people are afraid of as project rates is getting taken advantage of, right? right. They say, we'll do this whole project for four grand and they end up doing 10 grand a worth of work for four yep. grand. And they're like, well, we, that was a waste, right? Yeah. Project rates are terrible. They exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what I tell my clients is when they come in, we negotiate a project rate, right? Yeah. And then kind of my workflow is I will give you unlimited amount of revisions. And that's part of my, <laughs> that's part of my just kind of shtick because I Sounds it's not crazy. A shtick, it's not yeah. a shtick, yeah. but yeah. it's like, it's just my, Will Fortenberry, the unlimited revisions guy. Exactly. Dot com. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of it is, I remember working for other agencies and stuff and a revision would come in, hey, change this, you know, one graphic from red to blue. And for me, it's a five minute change, but the company would charge the client like an $800 change order. And I'm like, mm. that's not right. You yeah. know, that's not right. So for me, what it is, is just like, I want to get the project to a place where my clients are like ecstatic about it and happy yeah. about it. And they think it fulfills the job. Yeah. Right. And if it takes eight rounds of revisions to get there, great. If it takes one round, great. If it takes 32, great. I don't care. I will keep working on it yeah. until they're happy with it. 
Now, scope of work is different. If we start getting scope creep, if they start adding things, right, then we yeah. come back and have a negotiation about price. And that's mm -hmm. what I tell my clients. I say, hey, you know, we'll do it for the X amount of dollars. If the scope ends up changing, I will let you know. Because yep. a lot of times the scope creep is unintentional. They don't know they're adding scope. You know, but on yeah, the back it's, end, it's important do. to point that out that you yeah. are the guide for the client. In many cases, the client is uninformed or, or you know, just simply uh, ignorant of how this process works. Exactly, and so they don't mean to take advantage, but they maybe need to just you to to guide them, right? To be exactly. to educate them as to how this process works and help them to feel like you know they're under you and them are in lockstep along the way as this thing comes to fruition. Um, it's funny because I years ago, of course, like every other creative, I've kind of faced the same thing and. I would call it reversion, like, and, and and that's something that is, you know, we can we can mix words around here, but you know, you have revisions and you have reversions. A revision is something where, okay, let's take this text and change this word from, you know, this to that. Okay, great. Sure. You know, let's yeah. let's can we make this this slow down this animation a little bit? I know we it's, it's there a little quick. Okay, we'll slow it down. But yeah, hey, can we can we can we add? an airplane that comes in and lands on a mm -hmm. on the runway here and then explodes and you know it's like okay this is a different version mm -hmm. so now we are reversioning mm -hmm. or even re-envisioning what was you know before so do you try to include that language or that understanding um, in any kind of legal or, or you know letter of engagement or a contract? Well, and, I, and I'll tell you this: I, I, get, I do get burnt sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. I'd say about once every tenth or twelfth project, I it's kind of like you know. Like maybe I un, I misestimated what I thought, and I'm like, wow, I'm doing a lot of work for a very low fee right now. Right. But that's one out of every twelve. If the other eleven of those projects, I'm yep. making more mm -hmm. than what I would have, it, it all washes out. Yep. You know. Absolutely. So when when that happens, and you know, and I feel like okay, maybe this is a little different. I don't really have contracts or letters of engagement. Maybe I should that I sign with my clients. But a lot of my clients I have really solid relationships with because I've been working with them for years, okay. right? And so it's just, it's, it's kind of an understanding. And I always, and we always have the conversation up front. It's like, hey, I'll let you know if I'm getting taken advantage of and if, or if I feel like I am, you know? And, and mm -hmm. then I'll approach, you know, the client and say, hey, I think, you know, you guys moved the deadline up on me. It was due in two Fridays. Now it's due next Friday. That's going to incur a little bit of a rush fear. You guys are okay with that? And if they say no... Then I say, okay, well, we can approach this one of two ways. We can do the original deadline or we can cut the amount of work down yep. to get it done by here. And if they still want the same amount of work, you know, at the new deadline without paying a fee, that's when we start maybe getting a little bit uh, tense. Yeah, that's you know? where you want to fall back on your agreement that it's, you know, it's good to have that at that yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I try to always to put go, it in email, like, sure. so it's in writing somewhere, but... You know, a lot of my clients, like I said, we never get to that case. They, yeah. a lot of my clients, are educated and they super understand. Yep. Like, okay, we added a deliverable to this guy. Yeah. Like, we're gonna have to pay for it. Right. Right. So it's funny too, because when you have that philosophy, going back to the foundation of, I want to just take what I have to offer and do it to the best of my ability for my friend or my client with integrity. You tend to find other clients, like you work with those kinds of clients and you find other clients that also have those shared values. Exactly. And as long as you have shared values, it's going to be in most cases, right? Just fine. Totally. Um, but, but there's always, you know, as you work with larger and larger organizations, there's more and more people that come into the, into the pipeline, into the communication channels and so forth. And that experience can get muddied. Who was your, did you, did you have like a, a first big break or, or how did, how did you start to climb the ladder in terms of your, your client roster? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say a first big break. A lot of it is kind of just growing over time, right? Yep. So I, I worked at that studio in Atlanta for a while, and then I got hired by a church, a big church here in Atlanta, and uh, North Atlanta up in Alpharetta. And because I was making content for a church, tons of people were seeing that every the Sunday, content, constantly. Yeah. Ironically, and, churches can be a great springboard, right? I mean, yeah, I know a lot of people whose careers, a lot of way more talented motion. I mean, you mentioned than relationships, me. yeah, and you make a ton of relationships. I mean, you totally really, do. Business happens in relationships, and yeah, you make and a so ton of those when you work for a church. That's but, yeah. where I would say a lot of my clients have come from, right? And then mm -hmm. it's like, oh, you meet this producer that was attending one of your campuses, and they want you to work for them at their, you know, studio or production house. And it's like, okay, and then that producer goes on to a different studio, yeah. but that original studio is still hiring you, but your friend is now at that new place and now they're hiring you. So now you have two contacts. Mm -hmm. So I like to tell people all the time, I'm just riding the coattails of my friends.